Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this week, we're beginning a brand new series entitled Church Under Attack. This is part one, the beginning of persecution. You know, ever since its inception, in fact, ever since the time of its founder, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, his earthly ministry, the church's enemies have been trying to stomp it out. But stomp as they may, the gates of hell has not and will not prevail. They shall never, ever prevail, according to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. You can talk about God, and everything is fine. But if you talk about Jesus, then ears begin to prick up, and muscles become rigid. They're poised, just waiting to see which direction the conversation will turn. If we th say that Jesus is just a good man, we're okay. We can even say that he's a prophet. We're still fine. But once we define him as the son of the living God, to whom we must give an account, and in whom alone is found salvation, is salvation found, then we begin to have a problem. Whenever we say that it's him to whom we have to give an account, hairs begin to bristle, teeth begin to bear, and annoyance begins to stir. And then comes the unleashing of irrational anger. Even in the church scene, we can talk about Jesus. We can talk about him as being the loving good shepherd who sacrificed himself for his sheep. We can even define him as the Son of God. But do not say that he is still able to heal. Do not say that he still does miraculous things. He delivers miraculously or performs signs. And he does wonders still through his church today. They will seek to destroy you. They will say all manner of evil against you. They will call you all kinds of names and all types of heretic and even try to make life difficult for you. But this is what Jesus said about those who believe. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 through 18. He said, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Maybe the reason we are not seeing all of the signs and the wonders that we should is because we do not go into all of the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Half of the church has never even won one soul to the Lord Jesus. But those are the same people who will be the first to stand up and condemn someone for healing or Condemn them for performing signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Condemn them for getting souls won because of these signs and wonders. The Pharisees did the same thing. They conspired together to kill Jesus for the same sad reason. When he was just teaching, they all loved him. But as soon as he began to do signs and perform wonders and do miracles, and many, many acts of healing, they turned against him. Look at, my, uh, at John chapter 11, verse 45 through 53. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. 
nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. And you know here at Hold to Hope, we always like to give two or three witnesses to confirm the point that we are making. And there are many witnesses in Scripture. But let us take a look at this. Let us look at what the Pharisees' first thoughts were after Jesus healed the man with the withered hand. Matthew chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out. And it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Think about that. They didn't consider the great miracle that had just taken place. They didn't even consider the man's feelings. His hands were withered and it was now restored like the other one. No, they, they, they took none of that into consideration. Their first thoughts were, how can we destroy this man? How can we get him out of our lives? Now consider Stephen, the first recorded Christian martyr. He preached a long discourse. The Jews listened, and I'm sure they all agreed. They were all probably nodding their heads in agreement like, yeah, you're right, yeah, you're right. And, but when he said this in Acts chapter 7, verse 51 through 53, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. They were with him up to that point. But when Stephen said that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the Holy One, and that they were the ones who had killed him as their fathers killed the prophets, they were upset, furious even. Look at the scriptures. Acts chapter 7 verse 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. They were enraged, yes, but they only ground their teeth at him like some demonic spirit had entered them. But they did not make a move to harm him until this. This is what really pushed them over the edge. It was the signs and the wonders that Stephen began to describe as he looked up into heaven and he saw these things happening before his eyes. Acts chapter 7 verse 55 through 58. But he, Stephen, Full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They just couldn't take it anymore. It is something about signs and wonders that just drive people bonkers. I suppose the power of Almighty God is just too much for those who are not spirit-filled to handle. They just can't take it. You can talk with them all day long of how good Jesus is and how nothing or no one can ever pluck us out of His hands. But don't mention that you have to live a life of accountability, a life of righteousness, a life of holiness, and that you will have to give an account for everything you say and everything you do to Jesus. Then all hell breaks loose, and they will stop their ears and rush together as one and fall upon you. The Jews persecuted the Christians relentlessly, but they weren't the only ones. Their persecution 
doesn't even compare to that of the Romans. Look at what Nero did. Nero set Rome on fire and that burned a total of nine days, after which two-thirds of Rome was destroyed and countless lives um, lost. As the flames were ravaging the imperial city, apparently Nero went to play his harp and sing the song of the burning of Troy and openly declared that he wished the ruin of all things before his death. And how did, did, did Nero respond to the great fire? He blamed it all on the Christians. And that became the catalyst for the first Roman persecution. Which leads us into discussing one of the, or some of the atrocities that Nero brought about on the Christians in his great persecution. It is said that Nero even redefined cruelty and plotted all manner of punishment for the Christians that the most evil and devilish imagination could conjure up. He had some of the Christians sewn up in skins of wild animals. Then he would put them in arenas and he would soak the dogs on them. And the dogs would bite and tear at the Christians until the dogs tore the Christians to death. Other Christians, he, he, he dressed in shirts that were made stiff with wax. And then he had the Christians affixed to axle trees and set them on fire in his garden in order to illuminate his garden. Although this persecution was fierce, it did not diminish the spirit of Christianity, but rather it increased. Look, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It seems like the church experienced a little relief with the suicide of Nero and Vespian's uh, assumption to the imperial authority. Although it did not cease entirely, little is recorded about it. But whenever persecution breaks, breaks out, and it's as fierce, it seems like the church began to expand. The church begins to grow. Church growth is fueled, it seems, like by persecution. When the persecu persecution declines, the church begins to die out. But Fox's Book of Martyrs declares that the second persecution broke out under Domitian, the son of Vespian. The Roman Emperor Domitian reignited and even increased the fierce persecution of the church or anyone he deemed to be an atheist, meaning that they refused to worship him as a god. And that's according to some accounts. Despite his private vices, he set himself up as a reformer of morals and religion. He was the first of the Roman emperors to deify himself during his own lifetime by assuming the title Lord and God. These two acts coupled together helps to understand that he is the sixth man of lawlessness as John described in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 17 verse 10. For more detail on the seven men of lawlessness, that John described, see our video, The Seven Kings of Revelation 17, under er, the end times category. The mission escalated the terror on the Christians during his reign. Being naturally inclined to cruelty, he gave free reign to his hatred of Jesus, the people of God, but it wasn't just isolated to them. It wasn't just them alone that he persecuted but he persecuted many others which included um, political enemies political rivals 
um, divisive groups, and many other individuals of all kinds perished and meet, uh, and they met terrible fates under his administration. This persecution did not take Christians by surprise, for Jesus himself said in John chapter 15, verse 18 through 21, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. So, just to summarize what I've said, the church, the Christians, the Jesus followers have been persecuted from the very beginning, from the very time of Jesus himself. Jesus plainly told us that the world will hate us because it first hated him. The Jews and the Pharisees not only persecuted the church, but they first persecuted Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. But he was faithful and obedient even unto death, death on a cross. But praise the Lord, he rose again on the third day, and he is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, and is making intercessions for us day and night. He's interceding. He's coming back one day for us. His blood bought, the redeemed, his church, his people. And that day, I believe, is really, really close now. It's even knocking at the door. The persecution of the church continued from the Jews to the Romans with the tyrant emperor Nero, who sowed Christians in, in blood-drenched animal skins and soaked the dogs on them. Then came Domitian's um, dictatorial reign of terror in which many perished, but not just Christians, but political enemies, decisive groups and individuals of all kind met terrible fates and they refused, if they refused to worship the emperor or refused to worship the Roman gods. But worshiping, emperor worshiping, worshiping false gods did not sit well with the Jews and did not sit well with the Christians. Therefore they were persecuted. Domitian claimed deity he claimed to be a god, and he brutally persecuted anyone who said he wasn't, which caused him to be revealed as the sixth man of lawlessness in Revelation 17, verse 10. But even after the great persecution of the church, the spirit and faith of the Christians did not decrease, but rather it grew and expanded it got stronger during times of great persecution. So, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, you're on the winning side. Keep the faith and hold on to the end. The crown of, of life is stored up for all those who overcome. The blessings of the Lord be with you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold to Hope. And this is our first video in our new series, Church Under Attack. Thank you so much for watching. Be blessed and stay blessed.